Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Proof of Words podcast. I am, as always, your host, Patrick. And today with me, we have author Rune Ushtgan. Um, he is the author of Fraud Coin, A Thousand Year History of Inflation. And given that this has become a unfortunate topic that we've started to deal with on a societal basis, um, historically for many emerging countries, but particularly in Western society, in Europe and the United States, um, coming out of the COVID pandemic, or rather, I should say, our government's response to the COVID pandemic, uh, we've started to see rampant inflation. So, Rune, it's an absolute fantastic opportunity to have you on the podcast. Um, maybe just uh, by quick way of introduction, if you would maybe would like to give us a little bit about your book, um, Fraudcoin. Yes, thanks for having me, Pat. Uh, Fraudcoin, 1,000 years with inflation as policy. Uh, started out uh, as a pamphlet uh, in the spring or summer of 2022 when... Uh, in the price inflation reared its ugly head uh, all over all over the world um, almost. So um, I sent um, a draft to to um, a Goldberg in Oslo, and he said you should uh, uh, do a book out of this because it's too important to just have it as a pamphlet. And um, well, uh, that was um, a strike of luck that I talked to him because uh, it became the the most. Um, uh, uh, most popular economics book in Norway in between uh, 2022, uh, 20, 2023 and the summer of 2024. So it has done very well. Um, this is a book that I wrote for the average man, you know, the average reader. Mm -hmm. It's not written for economists or or in this particular group. Um, so it, I think that's also the reason why. So someone like me would actually be able to understand it then. Yeah, I would assume so. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's it was a pleasure writing it because I started um, interesting myself in uh, in the topic of money some twenty years ago. I read um, quite a lot of uh, Austrian economics uh, people's uh, book uh, books, you know, Murray Rothbard and uh, uh, Hayek and uh, and others and and. Um, so this was a good opportunity for me to write uh, my, it, it became my second book actually. And um, um, what's it, what, what it's about? I think it's, it's about the history of uh, monetary policy. And I, I have, I have seen and, and read a few books about money, but mm -hmm. I haven't, uh, I haven't previously seen a book which deals squarely with uh monetary policy and the history of monetary policy so that's something possibly something new um so and it's also about the nature of inflation and the nature of monetary policy how it affects those who are in charge of a monetary policy uh, typically the king in uh, ancient times and, uh, and also rulers today and and then of course how it affects uh, businesses and the uh, and the individuals, the citizens uh, um, today. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, I think the first part, uh, approximately how much uh, is it? It's, uh, it's uh, some 50, some 50 pages, uh, six, 60 pages is, is about the history of uh, uh, monetary policy and then mm -hmm. I have uh, a presentation of some key people um, who has contributed a great deal to promoting uh, uh, monetary policy in terms of creating uh, monetary inflation. Uh, for instance, um, our own uh, Professor Ragnar Frisch and John Maynard Keynes and uh, Professor Irving Fisher from the United States. Mm -hmm. And also some of the, the counter uh, forces, you might say, from the Austrian economic side. And then I, I try to, to, to pull this uh, together in the middle part of the book where I uh, sort of analyze um, the, the more recent history and uh, look into how, uh, how monetary policy affects society very concretely, you might say, by, by tracking some of the events from the 1980s and up to today. So it, it makes it very easy to understand what, what inflation is, what monetary policy is, um, mm -hmm. 
the relationship between monetary policy and price inflation, uh, the relationship between monetar monetary policy and the boom and bust cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good introduction to, to people who want to sort of get a, a, a basic understanding of the theory. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite comprehensive, but it's uh, an easy read and uh, an engaging read because I like to use uh, uh, yeah to present the characters, you know, both the villains uh, and the heroes, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, make it entertaining for people to 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 learn uh, about this topic and not not let it be a sort of a dry and uh, the dry subject. I, I hate dry books, so it has to be entertaining. Yeah. And it, it, it fascinates me because I never heard the word inflation, I think, my entire life until I took an AP economics course as a senior in high school, right? And of course, kind of growing up in the United States, obviously, that's where I'm from. Or even if you're growing up in the West, I don't feel like we teach basic financial literacy um, to the masses. You really have to take specialized courses if you're lucky enough to go to a high school or go to university that does that. Or when you go to university, you actually do have to study economics or maybe you go and take a couple of business courses or go for a business degree. Outside of that, the only time that you ever really get to learn about inflation is really when it rears its ugly head. Um, particularly in the West, I would say, because for instance, whenever you see, um, I mean, in the eighties, uh, at least in the United States, there was rampant inflation. You had, uh, the gas crisis, et cetera, et cetera. But for the last 30 or 40 years, inflation has been relatively tamed. Um, so I mean, why do you think it is that this very important concept is not necessarily taught more to the masses? Uh, because I have to assume that that was one of the main inspirations for you to write this book, to help educate people what inflation is, what causes it, and why maybe having a thousand years of inflationary policy is not best for the world, not best for society. So my, my motive was partly, of course, to educate the people and not only to give them knowledge, but also to, to give them a sort of an understanding because knowledge is, uh, is up there and understanding is, is more like a, a thing with the heart and the, how your emotions uh, get I like that. In this. And uh, so that was very important for me. And I, I guess, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a mansplainer. i am <laughs> always had that problem that I, I want very much to make people understand important issues. So I also, of course, wrote it for my own sake, you might say. And then um, um, why isn't it taught in schools? Well, man, there are many conspiracy uh, theories around uh, this topic, you know, and uh, I, I often say that I'm concerned I'm preoccupied with only one conspiracy in this context, and that is when um, inflation was introduced as a policy when the monetary system was monopolized, that happened in the, uh, approximately in the year 1050 after Christ in Norway. Uh, and that was a kind of a conspiracy. That's the only conspiracy that really interests me. Mm -hmm. uh, because all those other conspiracies and theories around conspiracies, you know, uh, with, for instance, how uh, the Federal Reserve was introduced um, in uh, 1913, 1940, uh, prepared in 1910 already and also further back. But that, that's also, a, for, of course, a, a some sort of a conspiracy. Uh, so, and that's, that's important for at least for my favorite part of that conspiracy um, is that, um, I forget which, uh, that what JP Morgan sank the Titanic to kill everybody that was opposed. <laughs> it would, I, I don't buy that at all, obviously, but that's my favorite part of the Federal Reserve currency that the Titanic sank to bring about central banking in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about that theory I, I either. Don't buy but, it, but uh, of it's course, hilarious. it's very important for Americans to understand sort of how the Federal Reserve came about. Because, yep. and and also they should read up on on I think on how the the Coinage Act of 1857 uh, came about because that was also an important piece of legislation. 
But for me, it was more important to understand how it happened in, in my country in 1050, just 16 years before the end of the Viking Age, because hmm. those days and those events there were very dramatic and very interesting. And uh, and also what happened in the in the early days and the, the, the first years after 1050 is very instructive. It's very interesting to see um, how how it affected the the policies and the, the centralization and wars and uh, etc. So that's that was important for me to 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 give uh, an insight uh, for the for the reader of the of this book. But 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 what why isn't it taught in school? I think first of all um, economics isn't in general taught in schools and, and then it uh, it follows quite naturally naturally that we, they don't teach us anything about money either yeah and uh, just to complement what you said uh, in in your introduction to your <clears throat> question there even if you if you study uh, finance um, uh, or economics i don't think that give you a proper understanding of uh, the nature of monetary policy and the motives of monetary policy. And it's quite skewed in, 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 in sort of the direction of Keynesian and monetarist uh, yeah. uh, stuff. And you don't get the understanding that the Austrian School of Economics uh, provides. So, so I think uh, even if they teach uh, some students something, it's, it's uh, not adequate, or at least it's not um, uh, comprehensive enough and um i mean so i remember my in high school uh we were only exclusively taught uh keynesian economics um hmm. which i mean it, i mean it fascinated me at the time i was 17 18 years old i didn't really know any better um i really only started to understand and learn about austrian economic policies um as i moved to europe and became more acquainted with these right um but what was interesting for me though is that Whenever these policies are taught, um, it's really kind of just imparted that inflation is natural and don't you dare ever question that, right? Mm. <laughs> um, I, so I guess my question to you would maybe be is, is inflation natural or should we be questioning uh, the natural nature of inflation? So um, how to address this? I think, first of all, you, ha you have to understand uh, or your viewers have to understand that Basically, we only have two types of monetary systems. Uh, you have monetary freedom, where people can choose uh, which money they want to use without any type of money having a privilege, for instance, that you are obliged to, to, to use that money to pay taxes and uh, things like that, uh, what you call legal tender. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you are free to, to use the money you like best. And you can also produce the money if you, if you want to. You can freely compete with other producers of money. That's monetary freedom. And then you have the other uh, type um, of uh, a monetary system, which is a monetary monopoly, which we have all over the world today. Mm -hmm. So um, a monetary mo monopoly means that uh, you have typically one issuer or a group of issuers of money. Today, it's the banking system. Um, which uh, is coordinated by the central banks um, in, in the production of money, and you are obliged to accept uh, payment with that kind of money, you know, legal tender, and you are forced to, to use it when you pay the taxes. So monetary freedom and monetary monopoly, it's a very important to dis distinction to make. And uh, if you have monetary freedom and people are free to use the money they like best, which has been more or less the situation for most part of the history of civilization. It's very important to understand that monetary monopoly is the exception, it's the experiment, so, sort of. Mm. So with monetary freedom, people tend to use uh, uh, money which uh, has a, some uh, quite a high degree of scarcity, for instance, gold coins. Yep. And the scarcity of go gold is... Uh, uh, is um, uh, it's instructive to, to, to understand how much gold, gold that is dug out of the ground every year. It's less than 2%. And if you then use gold as money, it typically follows that uh, the, the, the price inflation will, will be very low as well. And normally, uh, with a gold 
uh, uh, money uh, type of system, you will actually see that prices are decreasing because of increased productivity over time. So mm -hmm. you get what you call a price deflation. So price deflation is something you can have if the monetary uh, supply, money supply is relatively low and stable, and uh, and uh, yeah. Um, so so that's the natural state, I would say, that you are free to use the money you like best, and people can produce money and compete uh, for, for for creating the best money. While the political state is a monetary monopoly, where you have an issuer uh, of a monopoly currency or something like that, and um, then the and that would of course be the central bank. Yes, um, but it's 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 important to understand that the the uh, what you call it uh, um, the 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 institutions that created the coins uh, previously, the mints. Yes. Played uh, ex uh, almost exactly the same role as as uh, as the central bank. So the the mints they um, they um, uh, decided the money supply. They could increase the money supply. They could uh, de uh, decrease the money supply, uh, depending on the policy, the instructions that the kings gave them. So that's something which is lost often when we talk about uh, the history of monetary policy, that, that people don't understand that the central banks is just a, a, continua a continuation of, uh, of, of the mints. And um, when, when you have a monopoly in money creation, uh, then it's very tempting to increase the, the money supply because you can create money typically out of nothing. Today, you create money out of nothing. Um, uh, previously, when you, if you controlled the, the mint as a king, you could also create a sort of money out of nothing because you said that people had to come to you if they wanted to have um, uh, money that could be used in your country. They could exchange, um, uh, they could hand over foreign coins and get, get um, uh, the coins that uh, uh, belonged to that, that was produced by the mint, and mm -hmm. then uh, the mint typically took um, a, a share of the silver that uh, was handed over, and then the king uh, could uh, use that uh, surplus uh, silver to create coins for his own uh, consumption and yeah, investments, etc. So basically, he could cre create money out of nothing. Also, when uh, it was a coin uh, uh, money. A monetary system based on coinage, which is interesting that you put it that way, because um, I, th I think a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people will look to the mints and they'll say, "Well, okay, whenever we, whenever we abandoned uh, the gold system, the gold back system of the dollar and other major global currencies, um, and we adopted the more fiat standard, that was the moment in time where basically money printing and money counterfeiting, um, because I consider most dollars counterfeit dollars at this point in time, uh, that became a thing. But in truth, and maybe it wasn't as egregious um, under the minting system as it is with the fiat system, but it actually still happened where you kind of were, in a certain sense, creating money out of thin air, and you had to trust centralized parties, in particular these kingdoms, that they did in fact hold the reserves of silver, gold, or whatever would be considered money in treasury. Uh, which never really was the case anyway, especially mm. when this became a credit system. So what you had to trust back then was that the, the silver content or the, the gold content was uh, stable and high. Uh, but what they did, for instance, King Harald Hardrada, who was the first sort of inflationist king in Norway, and he took over in 1047 and he started um, uh, his monetary monopoly probably in 1050. So he mm. reduced uh, the silver content from 90% and down to approximately 30% in less in, in 16 years. And mm -hmm. that's um, an average um, increase in the money supply of uh, about 7% per year, which is exact or almost the exact same um, average um, increase in the money supply of dollars since um, since I was born. So mm -hmm. I was born in 1972, and the dollar they increase in the monetary in the supply of additional dollars since then has been on average approximately seven percent per year. 
And in Norway, it has been 9% per year since 1972, almost 9%. So, so it's, it's not much of a difference. It's the same thing. It's the same shit, new wrapping, basically. And the, mm-hmm. But if you go back to, for instance, the Roman, Roman Empire, uh, and uh, they, they started uh, using inflation as a policy towards the end of the first century. They, they increased the money supply uh, a, a little bit slower, uh, watering out or debasing the coins uh, at a, a sort of a lower rate than King Harald Hardrada did in Norway. So mm-hmm. it varies a little bit for, from, uh, yeah, from time to time and from uh, geographic area to, uh, to the other, and yeah, which king uh, ruled, which emperor was in charge, etc. So, but it's it's the same thing. Uh, going back to to the um, uh, Athens city state in uh, in, uh, in in Greece, beginning in the in the fifth century before Christ, uh, before Christ. So it, it's the same thing, same thing, and uh, it it has always been like that uh, since back since back then. It's, and it's interesting that you put it that way because I don't think people necessarily appreciate that and what its impact on those societies were. Would you say – so, okay, let's look at this as an example. I mean, the Roman culture, the Roman society, I mean, it was the dominant world power for hundreds of years. And it did erode a bit over time, but it was a large player for nearly over a 1,000 years, right? Would you say that them having – less inflation, that they were printing less money through um, playing with the uh, alloy of the coins themselves, did that help contribute to their longer-term sustainability relative to, for instance, uh, the Norwegian kings, the original Norwegian kings, or more modern societies that have higher uh, rates of inflation? And are there any other examples, for instance, of Maybe there's a society, I don't know, maybe in Asia or uh, Latin America or Africa where they had more of a deflationary or disinflationary policy to whatever their uh, coin or whatever their trade was. And what did that mean for the sustainability of that society? So what happens if you have, for instance, two neighbor kingdoms and the uh, kingdom A um, uh, keeps the money supply stable? Uh, doesn't increase uh, the money supply, uh, while Kingdom B inflates the money supply. What mm-hmm. happens then is, is, is two things, basically. First of all, talent and capital will move from Kingdom B to Kingdom A. And uh, uh, the second thing, which uh, might also be a consequence of the first thing, uh, will be that Kingdom B goes to war against King- Kingdom A. Um, <clears throat> for, for several reasons, but Basically, w- once you start inflating your money supply, it, it, you see that it pays off so handsomely. You, you create money out of nothing. You can compete with uh, the rest of society for the same yeah. scarce resources, etc. Then it becomes very tempting to, to try to um, uh, uh, widen your uh, empire, you know, uh, and, and yeah, um, to, to rule more people so you can make more money creating. Uh, uh, the money that the people need. So that's that's what, what what happens. And what I do know, but I don't know so much about the consequences about this, but uh, of this. But from what I understand, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, also called the Byzantine Empire, mm-hmm. they kept quite a stable. Uh, had used quite a stable silver coin after. Yeah, I don't know which period, but uh, uh, until about, I think, 1030, 1040 or something like that after Christ. And then they, uh, about 1030 after Christ. And then they started to, to debase the silver content or the, or the coins. So um, I think, I think you, uh, if you start to investigate this, you can find uh, s- several examples of what we are talking about. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, about now, and um, it, it, yeah, I have a, a quite a good example. For instance, um, in Norway, when King Harald Hardrada started introducing uh, or started his monetary monopoly, he def- uh, inflated uh, the money supply straight away, and his, he he he, he uh, used a part of the profits from that. 
to go to war against Denmark because he wanted to rule the uh, to the uh, to rule the Danish kingdom to um, yeah to expand his empire basically. And the Danish they hadn't uh, um, um, uh, abused their monetary monopoly uh, previously. So the Danish king he started uh, as a consequence of the invasion from Norway. The Danish king also started to debase the silver coins that he mm. uh, created. So it was sort of a defensive move, most likely from his um, uh, point of view. He, he, he probably f- found it hard to, to increase the taxes to pay for the defense of Denmark. So he instead, he did like uh, did the same as the Norwegian king. So in that in that way, you see you see that um, inflation policy spreads from one country to another via um, warring. Why? Uh, yeah. So the, very interesting to to study history and learn from these mechanisms. I mean, one of my conspiracy theories is, and I think that this is actually true, um, is that we went away from the gold standard and adopted the fiat standard solely to finance war as the United States. Um, Let's be honest, wars are expensive, and the U.S. has historically found itself in a lot of wars that it never should have been involved in Mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, But if you have to finance a Vietnam, well... What better way to do that than to print more money because nobody was willing to raise taxes? Um, it's interesting, though, because, I mean, a lot of people question or rather this new um, modern monetary theory, uh, MMT, I guess they call it. It says that the government can and should be able to print as much money as humanly possible, absorb as much debt as possible, and the government will continue to exist and it will have no real repercussions from that. What would be your criticism to this new MMT uh, related to how yeah modern monetary theory is employed today? I'm going to admit one thing to to you, Pat, and that is, although I'm aware of uh, MMT, I haven't spent as much as ten minutes trying to understand what they are dealing with because it's so ludicrous to begin with. Why would you even bother trying to learn? You know, this this is a more instructive. Uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, the, fo- the following. Uh, inflation started as a policy in Athens some 2,400 years ago. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, um, and everyone hated this. You know, the people understood it. They, they, they could take a coin, a, sil- a silver coin, and then the the bit and uh, in it, and they saw that wow, this is good silver. They understood this. They they could sense the inflation. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't just have to understand the, the 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 relationship between the money supply and the prices. They could sense the inflation and they could feel the inflation, and possibly, quite possibly, people uh, could suffer the death death sentence if they didn't accept the king's coins. So it was much easier to understand, to sort of feel what inflation and monetary policy is. And then it got a little bit more complex when when the king started using uh, paper money, for instance, in 1665, I think it was, the first um, example of... um, sort of royal stamped uh, uh, paper money started mm. out in, in uh, Sweden. And then it has got more and more complex with digital money, you know, so we, people don't understand the relationship there um, that well. Nonetheless, the important thing is to understand that it took 2,300 years until 1920s, beginning of 1930s, before some people from academia some economists, for instance, John Maynard Keynes, mm-hmm. he came and said, well, uh, inflation is, uh, is good for society. It's good for you. <laughs> we need a little bit of inflation. Yeah, because um, it, it smoothens things out and, and make people uh, invest more money. You, you don't over-save. The, the society don't save too much. People instead invest and spend money so you you keep the wheels turning and etc yep. and later on it was it was uh, termed um, by uh, i think it was a professor named tobin in the tobin tax guy and 
um, he, he, uh, he said that we need inflation to grease the wheels of the economy. <laughs> So it took it took sort of two thousand three hundred years because before some wise men uh, from academia came and said that um, we need inflation; it's good for society. But it's a it's a complete scam, of course. If you had said something like like that to to a Norwegian in ten fifty six or something like that, he would have punched you in the face. Mm -hmm. He would have understood how. What, what kind of a fraud you were if you tried to suggest something like that. And MMT is just more of the same. It's just trying to, to wrap it in uh, and, uh, some, some kind of new uh, theory uh, to, 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 to make it even more complex. Uh, but of course, it's very, very good for the government and the first users of the newly created money to mm -hmm. have a theory which backs uh, or, or which claims to back uh, what, what, what they benefit from. That's obvious. No need to question that. <laughs> so it's to your mind, what would be a more natural or rather just put bluntly a better monetary system? Is it something that still has elements of inflation? Is it something that is more deflationary as a currency by nature? Should we even have governments or even any centralized agency involved in monetary theory, in monetary policy? Um, to your last answer, uh, no. Uh, I think we should do as um, uh, Javier Millet, the president of President of Argentina has talked mm -hmm. about. He wants to reintroduce monetary freedom in Argentina. Because Argentina, they uh, introduced monetary freedom in 1816, after the re revolution there, when they kicked out the Spanish. They mm -hmm. kicked out the Spanish and then let people use the money they liked best and let the banks uh, issue the currencies that they wanted to issue. They, they, they used different types of bank currencies. And this system was a de facto uh, operating still in, I think, almost until 1930 or something like that. So um, this made it possible for the um, uh, economy in Argentina to grow at an impressive uh, pace. And also it's in instructive to look at what happened in the United States after, uh, approximately after uh, the revolution ended and the the, mm -hmm. um, they agreed with the English, with the British, that uh, sort of the, the United States was a sovereign country, a sovereign state, um, a republic. I think it was in 1783. So over there also they had monetary freedom, um, more or less until the central bank uh, came about in 1914. So and, and look at the growth that they have there. This is just some four or five generations ago. It's, it's like yesterday in historic terms. So what, what Javier Millet is doing now is something which I think it's very, it's very, very important. All the other countries could do this as well. I urge everyone to look into that uh, option. And uh, if we look at other countries, I think um, El Salvador, they have almost done the same because they, uh, they have now uh, both the US, dollars, uh, US dollar and uh, Bitcoin as um, uh, legal tender, which means that you have the, perhaps you have the best um, um, fiat currency which you can use for everyday transaction and you have the best uh, savings type of uh, money. Uh, Bitcoin for, 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 for saving as a saving, savings, monetary savings technology. Mm -hmm. So they are, although it's not uh, totally um, monetary freedom in El Salvador, it's almost in, in practice, it's, it's what you need. I mean, it brings elements of competition, right? Yes. And the spirit of monetary freedom is having completely unregulated competition. And while I would agree with you, I think that would be the dream um, from a monetary policy perspective, I don't think we're going to get there overnight. Um, for us to get there, you, I think you have to start incrementally. And I applaud Bukele um, for introducing not complete monetary freedom, but competition with his own native currency by adopting Bitcoin and the US dollar as legal tender there. So my question to you then would be, I mean, in this world of 
I mean, mass inflation um, in the West, we've seen double digit inflation in a lot of countries. We see hyperinflation in countries like uh, Venezuela. We've seen uh, rampant inflation, not quite hyperinflation in countries like Argentina. Um, this is something that happens in emerging economies on a day to day basis. Unfortunately, it's just the reality of some people's lives there. Where does Bitcoin and I'll even take it a step further, maybe not the dollar, just because the dollar is much more difficult to access for people in emerging economies, but stable coins um, like Tether or Circle that are backed by the dollar, at least in theory, um, mm. where does Bitcoin and stable coins maybe fit in this world as a part of that monetary freedom or even slightly restricted freedom, but still environments like competition like in El Salvador? Yes, exactly. That's that's the thing. It's I think you are you are going to have two major drivers here. First of all, technology as a, as a driver. For instance, the uh, adoption of stable coins, uh, different types of stable coins. Most probably, it's going to be USDT, Tether, which is all, already the most popular one. Mm -hmm. uh, but also others, and of course, also you are going to see that uh, more and more people make use of lightning transactions and different uh, services there where where they actually for instance if if i if i want to pay you i i don't know are you based in great britain at the moment uh, i'm actually in malta i'm in malta right now yes in um, malta. Yeah. Yeah. so what's the currency in malta is it euro uh yes malta is a part of the eu and i think they adopted the euro back in like 1992 1993 something along those lines i forget it or no i'm sorry yeah. they became a part of the eu then um and because of that they adopted the euro in parallel with everybody else yes so if if i want to do to make a quick payment to you uh i could perhaps use a strike service uh, and 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 pay with you know uh i pay with norwegian crowns from my account Mm -hmm. And it uh, it uh, it uh, is being automatically uh, transferred into Bitcoin via Lightning and the Strike service, and then it's being paid out to you to your bank account as euro. That's a sort of uh, the technological um, advancement uh, that we see these days. So you have you have sort of several technologies coming up now and services coming up now, which makes it more and more possible to 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 exploit a, a sort of a monetary freedom and uh, or state it differently that it can uh, make it necessary for, sort of or difficult for 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 at least the countries with small currencies to to continue to 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 protect their uh, monetary monopolies mm -hmm. and the, the second driver i think will be when you get competition between uh, different countries in terms of the capital, capital gains tax. Uh, for mm. instance, um, um, the capital gains tax uh, disappeared in El Salvador for Bitcoin when they adopted the Bitcoin as legal tender. Yep. And if you compare different uh, countries' um, uh, tax regimes, you, you see that they, they will tax uh, Bitcoin very differently. In, in Norway, it's 22% uh, uh, if you get a, a, a capital, capital gain on your, on your Bitcoin. I don't know what it is in Malta. Uh, so Malta, I think the capital gains tax is something in the 20s and Bitcoin is a part of that. Um, but I actually spent the last couple of years before being in Malta, uh, I lived in Germany for some time. And in Germany, they have a very unique tax treaty for Bitcoin and other crypto assets. Um, in Germany, they consider currency, and I don't even want to try pronouncing this German word. It's one of those German words where they put like five words together as one and the word ends up being like 60 <laughs> letters long, right? Um, but it roughly translates to unit of account um, and all currency falls underneath this German word for unit of account. And if you hold a unit of account for over a year, then it no longer is subject to capital gains taxes. Um, so for instance, if you hold gold, in the uh, in Europe, or I'm not in Europe, but in Germany, or you hold Bitcoin, or you hold Ethereum, um, unless they've changed the law recently, they do have a new parliament uh, last year, so maybe right. that's been altered. I don't think so, though. Um, 
I haven't been living there for the last few years, but effectively you could hold Bitcoin for a year and you would never owe any capital gains taxes on it whenever you decided to sell it, which is a unique approach. Um, hmm. I think Bitcoin as a currency should be non-taxable anyway, but I'm also a person that thinks taxation is theft to begin with. So <laughs> I'm probably not the person Say that should no. be advising Paul. Exactly. I'm maybe not the best person to be asking a, with uh, an expectation of an unbiased answer about yeah. that. <laughs> No, so tell me, um, interesting that you brought up capital gains tax there. Um, and I think there is going to be competition therein for it. We just saw, uh, for at least the first time, I don't know if it's in history, but at least the very first time in modern history, at least first time in my lifetime, um, a major politician, a presidential candidate in the United States proposed taxes on unrealized gains, granted only for a hundred million plus or so. Um, what type of impact could you see such a radical policy having on uh, a local economy such as the United States with this? Or um, do you think this is something that other countries, if she does end up winning the presidential election and does uh, ratify that in the tax codification, is that something that we're going to inevitably see in Norway and the rest of Europe using this playbook as an example done by Kamala Harris? It might be that people uh, want to try uh, that different countries want to try out that, but uh, you know it's very short-sighted and it's it's akin to um, eating the hen instead of the eggs. So um, it's uh, <laughs> no, I th I think it's difficult for them to 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 get the parliaments to approve uh, to to you know, get the Congress and parliaments to approve uh, such a proposal like that. Uh, it, it's so short-sighted, you know. It it uh, destroys the competitiveness, uh, and makes it, makes it even more difficult to um, to to compete with countries like uh, China and India and, and uh, perhaps also Russia should be mentioned here. So, I think uh, it's it's a very popular, you know, thing to to do to just propose a new tax or increase taxes, etc. But but. Uh, to put uh, something like like this through the uh, le legislative system and, and succeed, that's quite uh, quite something else. So. But my, some some might try. Yes, of course. We don't know. It's difficult to 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 tell what's going to happen in the future in general. So. It, it, it really is, and especially when you start to see policies as radical as this. Um, at being proposed on the main stage. Um, I have no idea how that's going to turn out. I would hope that you're right, that such a proposition is really just there to get votes and there's no real intention of putting it into practice, which I do think is the truth. But I guess we're just going to kind of have to wait and see what happens. Because one thing that we do know about politicians is a lot of political parties do play the medium and long term game and they'll throw out radical ideas just to see what the reaction will be. And then they continue to talk about it over the course of decades. And then all of a sudden, when the, when the population is more familiar and more comfortable with it, because they've heard it a hundred times before, you maybe have a generation turnover, all of a sudden you have a tax on unrealized gains. And I think that may be the longer term play there and why they're going about it this way. But I don't know. That's just a conspiracy theorist in me talking. Um, but one of the major talking points that has come up politically lately uh, is, of course, the concept of universal basic income, UBI. Um, proponents of it say that it's necessary because we're going to lose a lot of uh, jobs in the workforce from AI, um, automation, uh, robotics, etc. A lot of blue collar workers are going to be out of a job. Um, and as such, we need to have some sort of safety net, if you will. Um, I think it was Andrew Yang a few years ago when he was running for the Democrat nomination. Uh, he proposed that there should be a thousand dollars a month in every American's pockets. And we've heard proposals relatively similar to this the world over in dozens of jurisdictions. Now, I more subscribe to the theory that inflation isn't necessarily caused by price gouging. Um, by corporations. And of course, that is a small element to it. Um, if we're going to say, okay, there's a puzzle as to what truly causes inflation rather than one direct thing, corporate price gouging is a small element. I think that's there's truth to that statement. But I do think the biggest cause of it is A, money printing, um, and B, uh, government overspending, putting way too many dollars into circulation that would be unnecessary. Um, 
UBI to me seems like it would be nothing more than something that is not hyperinflationary, but severely inflationary. Um, what would be your thoughts on that? Do you think that a UBI is something that inevitably will become a necessity as the human workforce is replaced by automation and AI? And B, if we do get to that point, what type of impact could UBI have on inflation? And if we do have to have UBI, is there any way we can create mechanisms that limit its inflationary potential? So first of all, I think people should really understand that if a government proposes UBI, it's not because of the public interest or to, to make lives better for the, for the people. It's just another uh, way of controlling the people. And uh, yeah. the way they will try to do it probably is that those countries who, who uh, try to implement um, uh, central bank digital currencies in the, in the Western world, in the, in the sort of Western countries, uh, they might do this as a sort of a combined effort. They say that you, you can have UBI if you accept using uh, our central bank digital currencies and then it's quite obvious what they are trying to do isn't it so now ubi is 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 the worst thing uh, one of the worst policies that you can have it, it's very bad for the people who get used to it and uh, they gradually become dependent on it on it it's just like a drug you know so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very much against uh, ubi and whether it's going to have an impact on inflation, that's uh, of secondary importance. And I don't, I don't really care about what, what the answer is there. I, don't, I, I think that the motive, motives um, in terms of why they use different mechanisms, um, sometimes they increase the money supply, sometimes they just uh, de decrease the money supply. And... Other times, it, you see that they they are channeling money. It's it's not necessarily that they are increasing the money supply. They're just channeling the money supply in different mm -hmm. ways. There, there's so many me mechanisms they can use, and that's uh, that's more or less unaffected by introduction of UBI. So, UBI bad thing is it uh, any relationship there between UBI and the inflation? I, or monetary policy, I don't think much uh, of a relationship. It just, yeah, most likely uh, in, uh, something which uh, we will see in relationship to, to the central bank digital currency policies. And so it's interesting that you make that point because I actually pretty much view it the exact same way, especially with the implementation of CBDCs. And my fear would be is that for certain classes of people to receive UBI, um, you're obviously going to end up having that tied to a social credit score of some sort that you have to have certain elements of eligibility or certain levels of social credit to unlock different elements or different levels of UBI from the government. And I just kind of foresee that as a, I don't know, black mirror type horrifying dystopian reality that unfortunately I don't think we're that far away from um, if certain political cards fall certain ways. Yeah, it might be. And, uh, you know, you, Pat, and, and I and all, all the other citizens of, of this world, we have to decide should we let the others be players in the in this uh, power play, or, or and uh, we ourselves should just uh, be NPCs, or should we also become players? And I think it's it, we need to understand that there, there is a game going on here, and uh, we we need to just uh, fuck around and find out uh, uh, to 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 learn the rules of this game and engage ourselves, because um, if we don't, then others will play with us as sort of NPCs uh, who, who just uh, run around and do exactly what, what the rulers want us to do. And um, this is, this is uh, my, possibly my, my next project. I, I would like to, to write a book uh, which, which looks into this. Uh, what does this game look like, actually? Mm. What, what are the rules of these games? What are dominant strategies uh, for, for rulers? Also with, with reference to monetary. Uh, uh, policies and also other policies and what would the dominant strategies for, for the people be? I think 
that kind of book hasn't been written uh, yet, and uh, it would be very interesting to, to move on with a, with a project like that. So we, we shouldn't... I know I'd buy that book. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like an interesting study in game theory. Um, okay. that, would be a, that would be a fascinating so, read. Path one copy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You, you, yeah. you, you can tell your prospective publisher you got one book sold. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, we really need that book because you have a quite um, you have a few other books uh, written for for the rulers like um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Leviathan, and um, Nicola mm -hmm. Machiavelli's uh, Il Principe, the Prince. Uh, they so they have plenty of inspirational books, you know, to study and learn from, and they make <laughs> ample use of the of the theories. There, I'm quite I'm quite sure about that. So. No, we, we need to, to, to get up to speed, actually. We can't just sit and wait and worry. That's the, the, the worst thing that we can do. We need to discuss this, become players. Mm. So in the interest of time, because we are uh, kind of coming to the close of our hour here together, um, it, whenever we talk about inflation, um, particularly in the US and most countries, they have a similar calculation for it, um, CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Now, if you look at CPI, um, I'm just going to use the last four years. Um, these were uh, the COVID years and then the year or two immediately following um, COVID. And generally speaking, CPI would tell us that there has been a 20% over that four-ish year period uh, inflation of the U.S. dollar. But if you go and look at typical goods and services that the average retail American uh, would participate in. Like first off, housing and rent has skyrocketed the, during that period. You look at some cities, it's up 50, 60%. I think on average in the United States, rents are up like 25, 30%. So exceeding that inflation. Um, you look at the cost of meat. Meat is up roughly 40 to 50%, depending on where you live. Dairy is up something like 60 to 70%. Um, Beer, unfortunately for me, is up substantially. Uh, I think beer is up like 30% um, is what it is, but whatever. Um, but you look at all these goods and services, um, even the new iPhone is going to be more expensive than historic iPhones have been. And we know that they constantly change the index. They constantly change the methodology for calculating CPI. For instance, the most recent calculation of CPI didn't include coffee because coffee has gone up almost 100% over the last couple of years. <laughs> Why are they manipulating this number so much to make it seem like it's lower than it probably really is? I mean, my general assumption is, is that if somebody tells me inflation via CPI is at 5%, realistically, we're probably at least two or three times that number because of how they manipulate that index. Mm. Uh, would you agree with a statement like that? Or do you think CPI is relevant in today's day and age. So the, they constantly change how they calculate the, the CPI and whether you call it manipulation or something else, it, it's a, that's just a question of semantics. It, it's just to, to understand that CPI, CPI isn't some, some science uh, thing. It's not art either. It's better to call it a, a political tool, I would say. And then mm. uh, the question is, uh, do they abuse uh, this political tool? And uh, I think it's it's more, it's better to, to, to understand that. I think very few economists today uh, think that the CPI um, it gives a good representation of the, of the, of the price uh, developments these days. Well, the experts that they roll out on TV certainly seem to love it. Of course, uh, want to pay attention to it, but, uh, but for other reasons than uh, it being a sort of a good representation of uh, how the price develops. Uh, so, and, and the other question is, uh, uh, the other part of your question was, if I was a ruler or a government, why would I manipulate it? And the answer is very easy. If if you if you um, if you make sure that the CPI uh, shows a lower number that, than what the real number should be, what what the sort of real uh, price inflation would be, 
your motive would first of all be that it would be uh, become a little bit easier to print more money mm -hmm. or to uh, to generate yeah to create more money basically because that's yeah for instance united states it's it's the most important uh, export export good you know the us dollars so they want to to to, to continue to to profit from from this uh, uh, money printing so, but that's only one side of it. But the, and the, the second part of it is is uh, when you look to the welfare states, and I don't know if you can call the United States a welfare state country now, but uh, at least in, in Norway we we have welfare state, and most most of Europe and uh, yeah, it's becoming more so, but it's not really. So we have welfare states, and and having a low CPI means that you reduce the cost. For the government, mm. so you can increase the um, the income from the for the government by having a low CPI, and you reduce the cost for government by having a low CPI. Mm. So it's very easy to understand why they would like to manipulate it actively. So I remember when I was a kid, um, I mean, I used to work at PwC and we used to do the audits of uh, mutual funds. And there was one particular mutual fund I was auditing that uh, it, it, it was largely invested in what's called TIPS, uh, Treasury Inflationary Protected Securities, right? Which is basically, it's a treasury security, three, 10, whatever your uh, bond duration issued by the government, but mm -hmm. protects against inflation. And I've always thought, looking back on this, I mean, I was in my early 20s then, too stupid to realize what was actually going on at that time. But I always thought it was interesting that they use CPI for this, because now looking back retroactively, um, clearly the government wants CPI to be manipulated to show something as low as possible, A, for political gain, um, so they can pretend the economy is healthier than their policies are actually enabling, and B, because there is trillions of dollars in tips that are issued, Treasury Inflationary Protected Securities. Mm. If they have to adjust that for higher inflation to protect the investors in that tip, well, guess what? That is significantly higher debt expense for the U.S. government or any other type of government that issues such types of securities. So your perspective on that actually kind of just opened my eyes a little bit. So It, mm. it might be correct, but I think uh, in the, the market will understand that uh, the CPI uh, or, or the tips uh, aren't representative sort of uh, so it will it will mean that they uh, will bid less money for for the for the um, uh, securities there for the yeah it it so because <laughs> it's 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 not a good guarantee you know when when it's regulated yeah. with the CPI and I I was a little bit unclear um, uh, didn't uh, state it clearly enough. Uh, when I referred to the welfare state countries, that they reduce their expenses with a low CPI because, uh, and what I meant was that if you if you have an obligation to pay pensions to the citizens, citizens and other things, uh, which are often regulated, uh, adjusted in accordance with the CPI, they don't have to uh, increase the payments uh, that much uh, as if the, the CPI was representative of the of the real inflation. That was what I meant, to, just to be precise. Yeah. Well, so, Rune, this was a fantastic conversation, and I think unbelievably relevant, um, given the uh, political and the economic environment that we all currently find ourselves in in this day and age. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And I look forward to hopefully having you back on again sometime in the near future. A pleasure. I will. Of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you.